Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the White House. My name is Roberto Rodriguez. I am uh, the Special Assistant to President Obama for Education here at the Domestic Policy Council. And it's my honor to welcome you here today uh, and to thank you for joining us today for Democracy's Future, Education Reclaims Our Civic Mission. I want to welcome each of you here in person as well as those of you who are joining us online, tuning in on whitehouse.gov. Uh, it's an exciting day today that we have prepared, and I want to do all I can to make sure that we fit it all in, so I'm going to be brief here in welcoming you. I'd like to speak briefly about why we're hosting today's conference. I want to provide a high-level overview of today's agenda, and I'd like to do just some brief housekeeping before introducing our first speaker for opening remarks. So I'd like to discuss a few points that are relevant to today's event. First, we're gathered to begin a national conversation, a national dialogue about the purpose of education in our country. Uh, and to explore the role of schools, colleges, universities, and their partners in preparing our young people to be informed, engaged participants in civic and democratic life and in each of their respective communities. This afternoon's convening is framed on three important reports that I'd like to mention, uh, and these are important contributions to civic education that will be discussed throughout today's proceedings. The first is Guardian of Democracy, the Civic Mission of Schools. This is produced by the Coalition for the Civic Mission of Schools and released in October of last year. The second is A Crucible Moment, College Learning and Democracy's Future. This report is being released today. It was commissioned by our administration and produced by the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement. And third, Civic Learning and Engagement in Democracy, a Roadmap and Call to Action. This is produced by the Department of Education and also being released today. So I also want to uh, highlight that we will be announcing some key commitments by the Obama administration and other education stakeholders gathered today. That's another reason why we've all come together. And then finally, and most importantly, we are here to issue a call to action to accept a shared responsibility for the future of our students and to galvanize all of our partners here today, education, business, philanthropy, community-based organizations, and others, to, in this important effort to make sure that our young people are prepared for full citizenship so that they're ready to tackle the grand challenges that face our country and really lead us forward in the years to come. So I know I speak for everyone here today that I say that Today must not be a culminating event. It's really a catalytic one. This is the first of a national conversation that needs to happen to really promote civic learning and civic engagement in society. To give us just a quick sketch of our agenda, our undersecretary, and I'm going to ask each of uh, my colleagues here to um, raise their hands so that the audience can recognize them as I mention them. Uh, our Undersecretary of Education, Martha Cantor, will tell us why the Department of Education commissioned the Crucible Moment Report. Martha. And, uh, and Carol Schneider of the Association for American Colleges and Universities will highlight the report's findings. Our National Endowment for the Humanities Chairman, Jim Leach, will moderate a panel on higher education's call for engagement in democracy. Jim, thank you. And Kettering Foundation President David Matthews will moderate a discussion with students and educators titled Changing Lives, Changing Communities. Harry Boyt, Director of the Center for De Democracy and Citizenship at Augsburg College will describe the new American Commonwealth Project and introduce a short video that provides the framework for our breakout sessions. And then we'll break into small group discussions. So some of you are joining us on whitehouse.gov. I know many of you have organized your own local discussions. When we return for the remainder of the program, we'll hear report outs from these White House discussions. Those of you online can send highlights of your conversations to civiclearning at ed.gov. And then we'll hear some announcements from these new civic learning commitments before remarks from three key administration officials. We'll hear from our own outstanding Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. 
we'll hear from Robert Velasco, the CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service, and then my own colleague, Jonathan Greenblatt, Director of the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. We'll be guided all along throughout the course of our program today by Dr. Eduardo Ochoa, who's Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education, and he'll serve as our MC throughout our time here. And finally, I'd like to just issue a brief reminder for you to silence your electronic devices throughout our conversation today. So now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Valerie Jarrett, Senior Advisor to President Obama and Assistant to the President for Intergovernmental Affairs. Ms. Jarrett has been a beacon of civic leadership, both in government and in business. It's an honor for me to welcome her. Please uh, join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Roberto. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. I want to start by uh, singling out for thanks both Jim Leach and David Matthews, who did so much in terms of their leadership pulling together this forum today. And of course, Martha Cantor, who uh, Ro Roberto mentioned from the Department of Education, who's also been instrumental. And Arnie Duncan, our secretary, is looking so forward to, to joining you a little later in the day. Uh, President Obama has made education his top priority. Hopefully that's no secret to you. And as we think about the education system and preparing our young people for job opportunities after they finish school, it's also important to think about the fact that we're preparing them for life. And I come at this, and I'll just tell you my personal story, I served uh, as vice chair of the board of the University of Chicago for a number of years and chair of the Medical Center. And it's uh, one of the organizations that I worked in with the First Lady. And her first position at the University of Chicago uh, was working in the President's office, organizing the students to do volunteer work. And it wasn't that the students didn't do volunteer work before, it's that the President had not valued it and hadn't helped organize the students and hadn't helped steer them to the paths of really constructive organizations within the Chicago area where they could volunteer and actually thrive and have a, have a part of their education that rounded them out as a whole person. And we spent a lot of time during those years talking about how best to optimize these extraordinary academic institutions to broaden the shaping of the students. Um, I served on the board of a local community development organization also when I was living in High Park, and the university uh, placed one of its senior officers on that board. And the mission of that not-for-profit was to work with the communities surrounding the university to improve the quality of life for the residents. The university, for those of you who aren't familiar with Chicago, uh, is in a great neighborhood not far from downtown, right on the lake, but it's surrounded by, on three sides, by very poor, predominantly African-American communities, the fourth side by this beautiful lake. And for so long, the university didn't have a great relationship with the surrounding community. And through the leadership of then President Sun and Shine, supported by President Randall and then President Zimmer, it really worked to break down the barriers of its relationship with the surrounding neighborhoods, not just because it was in the self-interest of the university, but because it was a part of its mission. And I think that it sent a message to the students about their responsibility for the surrounding community and that if they really were going to be a member not just of the institutional community, but of the broader community, that they had to engage. And so that experience really, I think, shaped my life. I know it shaped the First Lady, and it certainly shaped the President, since we used to talk to him a great deal about this when he was a professor at the University of Chicago. And the whole thought was, let's get everyone engaged, and let's really focus on the students from the perspective of their civic responsibility in, in addition to their academic excellence. And so we welcome you here, and we hope that this provides us, as Roberto said, a launching off point, a catalyst, the beginning of what we hope will be an ongoing engagement. We're hoping that we'll be able to share best practices across such an extraordinary uh, group of, of experts in the field. And we really want, for all those who are listening out there or watching um, on the internet, to heighten the dialogue and have everyone appreciate this really unique opportunity we have with a president who values education as much as President Obama does and who also values the importance of engagement and sharing um, across the country. So I'm delighted to be here to welcome you uh, to the White House, and I hope that you have a terrific afternoon. We're so excited about this, and we look forward to an ongoing conversation with you. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ms. Jarrett. We know she's very busy. Uh, it says a lot in terms of this administration's commitment to educating students for citizenship to have Valerie Jarrett join us today. Uh, as it was mentioned, we have an ambitious agenda today, so we're going to move right into our next speakers. Under Secretary Martha Cantor is a lifelong educator and administration's lead champion for President Obama's 2020 goal to have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world by 2020. Under Secretary Cantor, we'll discuss what led her to commission the report being released today by the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement over a year ago. And we'll then hear from Carol Schneider as well. Uh, now to Dr. Cantor, my boss. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and delighted that all of us could come together really for one purpose. So you heard Eduardo talk about uh, the president's 2020 goal, which is to have the best educated, most competitive workforce in the world. And when I heard him talk about that shortly after he was elected in 2009, I thought to myself, who will these people be? What kinds of people will they be to lead this country forward? So while the goal may be to have more graduates, I think stepping back from that a little bit and thinking about who those graduates will be, will be the people who will lead the next generation. So for us, the goal is to prepare each new generation to be hopefully more civically minded, more engaged, and more ready to lead so that we can do a lot better than, in my view, we've done in the last 50 to, to 100 years. So, you know, when I think about over this past year what's happened, um, the universal human hunger for equal justice and progress and for shared tolerance and dignity was unleashed with far-reaching consequences in an unexpected part of the world. As the Arab Spring crossed borders and seasons passed, we looked across and looked at the great price of freedom. Uh, and so like many of you, our eyes were on the Middle East. We were looking at what was happening across not only America because of that, but across the world. And we witnessed, I think, all of us, the great price of freedom and the far greater promise that gives men and women the courage to pay that price. So when I think now to where we are today, um, I truly believe that the struggle to shape and secure more representative forms of government in nations around the globe will be a hallmark of, of the 21st century. So I, like many of you in this audience, worry about the democracy and then worry about who are the students that we're graduating that will become the people who will lead our democracy forward and run the corporations and run the small businesses and be the teachers in the school and be the firefighter next door. So I think it's in that context that when President Obama gave his speech uh, at Cairo University in 2009, he said, we have a responsibility to join together on behalf of the world that we seek, a world where governments serve their citizens and the rights of all God's children are respected, but we have the power to make the world we seek only if we have the courage to make a new beginning. And I think those words really uh, resonated with me, and I'm sure it's an audience of friends here that felt similarly. So today, you know, for our country, this is no less consequential for me than the Arab Spring has been most recently. Um, it's time to renew our sense of who we are, what we stand for, what we would like to see happen in our colleges and universities, in our K-12 schools. I'm thrilled that the Civic Mission of Schools is here, as well as all the higher education leaders. I see Nancy Cantor out in the audience from Syracuse and others who have done so much. I think every person in this room has done so much over the last 20 and 30 years, and I think it's time for us to all galvanize together to see where we go next. So that's what we hope to do this afternoon. Um, as no time uh, to, as today has education mattered more, um, a generation ago we led the world in college attainment. Today we're 16th in the world. Um, so when President Obama says he'd like us to be the best we can be, and I know there's a flag that goes up sometimes saying, does being the best mean that other people will not be the best? 
And to that I say no. It means that we need many more BEFs in this country. And the reason we, we can do this is to have many more high-performing, high-functioning democracies that will be led by the children in our K-12 schools and the adults that are in college today. So by promoting the reforms that I think our administra administration has, has, has stood for, at least I've, I've been here two and a half years, I'm not sure about Roberto and the others, other colleagues from the Department of Education, uh, but when we think about excellence and equity in education and the, the no nomenclature about winning the future, for me, it's, it's winning our civic life. It's winning our democracy. It's taking our democracy back to its roots and moving it forward so we can really have a modern democracy that we all are proud of. And the president has made very clear that education is a civic and moral imperative as well as an economic imperative. So that also has been a driver for me and for Dr. Oshoa and others of us in the Department of Education. I think you'll hear Arnie Duncan talk about this when he comes and speaks with you at the end of the afternoon. Uh, I'm very concerned, if, as you'll read in the Crucible Moment Report, uh, the 2010 National Assessment of Education Progress, NAEP, among the fourth and eighth and twelfth grade students tested. No age group has reached even 30 percent performance in proficiency in civics. I mean, that's, for our nation, we have to change this, and higher education can play an enormous role in doing that, especially with the talk and work around the college and career standards. As we raise standards, let's raise the content of what civic learning really can be for students in the K-12 system, as well as the undergraduate and graduate students. Um, NAEP found a persistent and significant civ civic achievement gap among, among racial and ethnic groups and documented declines in our overall civic knowledge of high school seniors between 2006 and 2010. So it's for good reason that our current lack of civic education and participation has been called by some scholars a civic recession. And that's why we have to have a renewed focus on civic learning in our coursework and across the curriculum and across all sectors of education, public and private, for-profit, non-profit organizations. Um, as noted in the recent studies, including the Guardian of Democracy report that you have in your packet, which we're making available to you today, um, I don't, I think, need to preach to the choir about the benefits of civic knowledge and skills and dispositions, why this works, what we need is more scholarship, and I think you'll hear from some of our scholars like Harry Boyd and others who are here this afternoon, Carol Schneider, about the importance of scholarship and why we hope those of you from the philanthropic and uh, education sectors can help us really get more scholarship around why civic learning changes how students pass through the education system at all levels. Does it make them better students? Does it help them graduate faster, be retained, be excited about what they're learning? All of those pieces. So in short, I think I want to just uh, hand over to Carol Schneider. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what you'll see in a few moments. We have uh, a number of reports. We have nine areas of action. We're releasing our roadmap for civic learning and democratic engagement today in the department, and you're the first to actually get a copy, so we're very excited about that. And a lot of what we are doing is building on the work that all of you together have done over the last 20, 30 uh, years that we've been engaged in this. So you'll have the opportunity to look at um, this, this graphic design that has taken a lot of work behind the scenes. It's called our STAR. And it has five points, and Dr. Boyd will tell you more about it, uh, about how to advance civic learning. What does evidence look like if we talk about civic impact? I, wanna, I know that ASCU is here, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. They've done a tremendous amount of work in democracy and looking at civic indicators, uh, how to expand public scholarship and research, uh, and how to really deepen civic identity for all of the people in our education system and throughout our communities. We have so many coming back into education. You know, one of the statistics I run around with quite a bit is why over in, in six years uh, do we lose 50% of the, of the students in higher education on average? That is, that is a tragedy. That is human capital for the business community. That is talent for educators like me that are lost to our democracy. So we've got to get these people back in, and this is one way back in. Um, still, you know, all of us in government, and I, I hope I'm saying this for other people in government here, we know that the best ideas about how to work together and how to get things done are going to come from you, 
are going to come from the field. And we know that our role will be to provide the leadership to figure out what the role of if federal policy can be, how we can have more impact in all of this. And a year and a half ago, uh, as, as Roberto mentioned, we charged the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement to assess the current state of what's happening in education for democracy. And that helped us bring together with many of you who were part of that effort uh, over 100 people to produce a report that you also have in your packet uh, that is called The Crucible Moment that Carol Schneider will talk to you about in just a moment. And it really has been uh, what really energized the creation of the roadmap that our Department of Education has put together and what that roadmap we plan to take out to other agencies in government, much less use it as our work plan going forward. Uh, so let me close by just telling you that before taking office, when our president outlined his vision to reinforce the ideals of democracy, he took as his theme, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. Those were his words that he captured from the Constitution. And so that also is the guiding force for what we're doing, how we're tying our 2020 goal to that, how we're tying all of our work in college completion, and certainly the foundation to all of that is to have the kinds of people we want to lead our country forward, as I said. So now let me ask Dr. Carol Schneider to come up. She is, has been truly a tireless leader of the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement. It's a long title. Um, she'll tell you about the key findings and recommendations from a crucible moment, and then we'll get into the heart and meat of the discussion. Thanks so much. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Martha, for bringing us together. Um, the room is full of friends and longtime leaders in this effort, but it is a joy to come together as we, as we launch the next phase. Martha has mentioned to you, Guardians of uh, Democracy, the report on uh, civic learning in K-12 education. In a crucible moment, the report on higher education that we're releasing this afternoon is very much a companion piece to that. The core message in both these reports is captured in the subtitle of today's forum. We are calling on educators at all levels to reclaim our civic mission, to put it back at the center, and to make both civic learning and democratic engagement a widely shared expectation and an achievement for all students at all levels, from school through graduation. We also are calling on educators to reinvent the way we prepare students to take responsibility for democracy and to promote a contemporary design for civic learning that combines rich knowledge, including knowledge of democratic principles and practices, with direct, hands-on, face-to-face, collaborative work in our communities on public problems that affect the future of our democracy, problems like poverty and literacy and nutrition and health and the environment. So the key idea in this new report is that we need to prepare students with knowledge for democratic community and civic problem solving. And we need to replenish our capacity to work together, even or perhaps especially when we disagree with our partners. But before I talk about these specific uh, recommendations, I want to acknowledge and thank everyone who actually contributed to this work. Martha Cantor and her extraordinary colleagues, civic-minded to, to a, a fault at the, university, uh, at the Department of Education, the other members of the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement, Larry Brasscamp of Global Perspectives Institute, who actually helped lead the whole effort that resulted in this report, and I especially want to salute, and would she raise her hand, please, my colleague Karen McTime Musel, who served as the scribe and the lead author for this report. Karen? But most of all, I want to acknowledge all the other authors of this report, many of whom are actually in this room, came together to talk with us in answer to Martha's question, where are we today, where do we want to go, what does it mean to take civic learning and democratic uh, engagement to the next level? This report was written through a year-long dialogue with many of you and educators around the country, including some who are tuning in through live streaming from sites elsewhere. All of you helped us frame these recommendations, and we tried to give voice to your insights and your vision. But even more importantly, the work that has been done by people in this room and around the country shows that what we are recommending in this report can be done 
because you have already created pockets of promising pr practice all over the country that shows us that what we're recommending is achievable. So what are we recommending? We're signaling with the very title of this report, A Crucible Moment, the scope and the severity of the challenges we face at this moment in our history. Clearly, we have entered a turbulent, roiling period of long-term change, change in the economy, in the global community, in the way we interact as a nation with other parts of the world taking their own place on the international stage. We've always thought of ourselves as an opportunity society, but now we face the reality of deepening economic divides and of growing worry that too many Americans may be left behind. So like earlier difficult eras in this history, in our history, this time of severe testing, this crucible moment, forces us back to foundational decisions about who we are as a society, what we believe, what it actually means to contribute to democracy. And Crucible argues that as we face these difficult and far-reaching questions, higher education can and should play a far more central, visible and influential leadership role in building civic capital, intellectual, practical, and ethical, that democracy needs at this moment to ensure its future. The report points to earlier crucible moments in American history, for example, the Civil War, when we invested in the Morrill Act and founded land-grant universities, democracy colleges, or the period following World War II, uh, when we were again uh, uh, up to our eyeballs in debt, but nonetheless turned directly to a broad investment in higher education to be the carrier of democratic ideals and practices. And this is what we are arguing we need to do again today. But as virtually everyone, and many of you who came to our round tables behind this report uh, uh, underscored, we need to face the unhappy reality that education's democracy mission, both in the schools and in post-secondary education, has largely been pushed to the sidelines. For the past generation, we have talked, at least in public, only about the connections between higher education and the economy. The Guardians of Democracy report on the schools points out that we have focused our entire educational system at all levels primarily on two big C's, college and careers, while falling completely silent on that third C, which is citizenship. So in its key recommendation, uh, Crucible is calling on all of us to work together to change the national dialogue, to recommit uh, ourselves to democracy as a core mission of higher education, essential to our future and to develop that contemporary framework for civic learning that includes and pulls together rich knowledge, strong skills, examine democratic values, what does it really mean to be committed to, to liberty, to democracy, to justice, to human dignity, what does that mean? What does it require of us? And also direct experience in actually contributing to our communities. Now thanks to the creativity of civic minders, minded educators in this room and around the country, the component parts for the new vision we're recommending are all already in place. You have been inventing them over the last two, generation, two decades. We have new curriculum models for general education that explore democratic issues and dilemmas. We have new curriculum models for moving public issues and social responsibility directly into students' career preparation, not separating it from preparation for the economy, but putting it right in the middle of it. We have powerful pedagogies and research on them, like intergroup dialogues, interfaith dialogues, service learning, that teach people how to work together even when they disagree. We have creative public partnerships between higher education and civic organizations that have already been formed and that are working together over the long term to solve systemic problems in our society. And we have new supports and recognition for public scholarship and the recognition that we need this kind of public scholarship, scholars working together with the communities to make a difference to democracy. And we have new tools that we're working on now to, to how to assess the actual results of our civic investments. But these democracy innovations are still partial rather than pervasive. The evidence suggests, taken together, and there's a lot of it in this report, that only about one-third of our students are even taking a single course that connect their academic studies with the community. Although when students do do that kind of thing, it actually has a positive effect on their completion, their persistence and their completion. And only one third of our students think the college really helped them gain in their capacity to contribute to democracy. So the goal for the immediate future needs to be to involve everyone in this kind of learning, not just some students, as is now the case. The liberal arts and sciences core curriculum is very much central to this vision for 21st century de democratic learning. 
and a crucible moment calls for new attention in the core curriculum to democracy itself. We want to salute institutions like Miami-Dade, which is the largest uh, not-for-profit institution in the country, has 150,000 students, and requires civic learning and engagement of every single one of them. But general education is only a part of the equation. College majors also have to play a part in this, and one of our uh, path-breaking recommendations is that every major, every discipline, including the career and professional fields, needs to include public questions and public work centrally in its curriculum. Those who are going into careers in science, in health, in engineering, in education, in business, accounting, public service, and in the trades, are all going to face public questions in the course of their careers. And what we want to do is to provide opportunities, as many institutions now do. We mentioned uh, institutions like Worcester Polytechnic uh, in Massachusetts and uh, California State University Monterey Bay, whose president is here, two institutions that have made civic learning central to the way they prepare people for careers in their majors. Now, many people are going to respond to this by saying, this sounds like a good thing, but can we afford it? And what about jobs? Don't we really need to invest in jobs at this point uh, in our history? But this is not an either-or choice. Employers are pleading with us to send them people who know how to work with diverse partners in teams to solve problems. And when we put students into the community with partners in diverse teams to learn how to solve civic problems, we are also building capacities that they need for the workplace. So it's a win-win, good for the economy and good for democracy. The long-term challenge, of course, is not just to point to these marvelous examples of good practice that you have already invented. The long-term challenge is to take this work to the next level. We're reaching a few students. We have some wonderful examples all over the country, and you invented them. But we need to commit ourselves today, not just to new efforts, but to newly aligned and coordinated efforts, to pull together all these pockets of work on different parts of our enterprise, to recommit ourselves in a deepened understanding of what it means to build capital for democracy and to make that work a point of pride and a signature for all of American education. Thank you. Martha and Carol, thank you very much for providing a, a, a great way of framing the, the conversation that's going to be following. I'm, I'm a great admirer of Carol's work in uh, ACU and also the work that uh, uh, was the foundation for it, uh, led by Judith Romelli and uh, Greater Expectations. Um, now we're going to move into our two panel discussions, and I would ask uh, Jim Leach and the panelists to move up to the stage as I introduce Jim. Um, the topic of our first panel explores higher education's call for engagement in democracy and will be moderated by uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Chairman Jim Leach. Jim was nominated by President Obama <clears throat> to act as the Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, an independent grant-making organization of the U.S. government dedicated to supporting research, education, preservation, and public programs in the humanities. Prior to his nomination, Chairman Leach worked in academia and for 30 years served as a representative in Congress. And probably Congress was a better place for it. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today, and we look forward to the panel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the civic mission in higher education has two dimensions. The first, the academic realm, is designed to expand a student's knowledge and skills, empowering him or her to utilize your learning in future vocations, avocations, in citizenship arenas. The second, experiential learning, is about hands-on civic engagement. Within the academy, there is a rife debate about what is essential to study and what are critical activities to, incentive, to incentivize in a job-short economy and increasingly splintered social circumstance. There is a growing trend, for instance, to move away from studies in the liberal arts. This trend, in my view, is a profound mistake, one which jeopardizes our democracy and the national interest itself. One of the myths of our time is that the liberal arts are impractical, unrelated to a subsequent work environment and the challenges of public policy. Actually, they're not only practical, but central to long-term American competitiveness and our capacity to interrelate effectively with the rest of the world. 
What is needed in a world in constant flux is a new understanding of the meaning of the basics in education. Traditionally, the basics are about the three R's, which in my state of Iowa are sometimes referred to as reading, writing, and wrestling. <laughs> but however defined, they are critical. Nonetheless, they are insufficient. What are also needed are studies and activities that provide perspective on our times and foster citizenship, citizen understanding of our own communities, other cultures, and the creative process. To understand and compete in the world, we need a fourth R, what for lack of a precise moniker might be described as reality, which includes not only relevant knowledge of the world near and far, but the imaginative capacity and experiential background to put oneself in the shoes of others. Road thinking is the hallmark of the status quo. Stimulating the imagination is the key to the future. As Einstein once observed, imagination is more important than knowledge. History, literature, philosophy, and related disciplines are studies that provide reference points. They give context to problems in the communities in which we live and life on the planet. As President Obama thoughtfully once noted, creativity and a thirst for understanding are the fuel that has fed our nation's success for centuries. We have, in other words, little rational choice except to understand others and our communities more deeply. Which brings me to the second dimension of civic education. Reality, the fourth R, requires understanding and learning that engagement uniquely provides. Students, no less than their parents and grandparents, have citizenship responsibilities. Just as vocational internships provide glimpses of the job world, engagement in community provides lessons in life and citizenship. To discuss these issues, we have today three exceptional panelists. Brian Murphy, the president of Dianza College in Cupertino, California, has taught political theory at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Santa Clara University, and San Francisco State University. He has served on numerous city commissions and nonprofit boards in San Francisco. Dr. Murphy received a BA from Williams College and advanced degrees from the University of California, Berkeley. Richard Guarsi, the president of Wagner College in Long Island, leads the Port Richmond Partnership, an effort in which students work in partnership with over 20 neighborhood organizations and institutions addressing the challenges of the Port Richmond neighborhood in the areas of healthcare, K-12 education, and economic development. The partnership has led, among other initiatives, in the creation of two charter schools. Dr. Guarzi received a BS from Fordham University and advanced degrees from Indiana University. Azar Nafisi, a visiting professor at the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University, is best known as the author of the national bestseller, Reading Lolita in Tehran, a memoir in books, and Things I Have Been Silent About, a memoir about culture, history, and loss. She has written widely for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, The Guardian, and New Republic. Dr. Nafisi is currently working on a book entitled Republic of the Imagination, which is about the power of literature to liberate minds and peoples. Brian? Thank you. And thank all of you for coming. It's an honor to be here today, to be with so many friends and colleagues. Um, I'm here to give you some good news. The founding of a national coalition of community colleges committed to this work. Because that uh, new project was inspired by our students and grew out of their work, I thought I might start first with the students. De Anza College is a public two-year community college, one of 112 community colleges in California. We are a large diverse urban institution, 24,500 students, serving one of the most dynamic and contradictory regions in the United States. If Silicon Valley fancies itself the center of post-industrial innovation, it is also a place of startling inequality, underemployment, underfunded schools, and decimated public services. De Anza's students come from that region, all across it. And they share many of the characteristics of community college students all across the nation. 
They are overwhelmingly first generation. They are largely working class and immigrant. They most often are working full time and many are balancing their obligations as students with their obligations as parents. Many of them come to us right out of high school, but many more come to us as refugees from an economy that no longer employs them. Like many community college students across the country, we have an astonishing ethnic, racial, linguistic, and cultural diversity. And let me be very concrete to give you some sense of the students with whom we work. At the ends of there are 3,200 Latino, mostly Mexican-American students. There are 3,000 Chinese Americans. There are 1,500 Filipino Americans. There are 1,200 Indo-Americans. There are 1,200 African Americans. The census tells us there are 5,600 white students of whom 534 are Iranian. They come to us from across the region and around the world. 515 of them are veterans from America's current wars. 85% of our students test into pre-collegiate work, and yet every year thousands transfer to four-year institutions. Our students are imaginative, they are smart, they have enormous talent. 75% of them speak at least two languages. So what do they want from this college? And what does today's topic have to do with their dreams and their hopes? They want good and meaningful work. Of course, they want the skills and the knowledge as required for employment. But they also want a lot more. They want meaningful lives. They want to learn how to navigate the public and private bureaucracies that circumscribe so much of those lives. They want to understand how power works. Who has it? What are its sources? How do you confront it or affect it or build it? They want the skills required to protect or defend the interests of their communities and work across the boundaries that separate those communities. They want to learn how to build a healthy and more equitable region across the deep differences of race and class and gender and privilege that divides their world and ours. They want and they need and they organize for, in short, an education in democratic practice. Not just the abstractions of democratic institutions or what we might call civics, but the rich and complex activity that brings them alive. They want to be principled, informed, literate, and generous citizens regardless of their legal status right now. America's community colleges enroll about half of the undergraduates in the country. We do not need to be told to prepare students for the new economy. We know that, and they demand it. The real question for us in America's community colleges is can we prepare our students for the new politics? There is no one way to do this, to teach democracy across the curriculum. But this connection has already begun with a project we call the Democracy Commitment. It is a national coalition of America's community colleges committed to the work of democracy for preparing our students for their lives as citizens in their communities, their states, and the cities, and the, and the country itself. Preparing students to engage. And many of the colleges with whom you are familiar are part of the original signatory group, Miami-Dade, Maricopa, Georgia Perimeter, Mount Wachusett, and Delta, and Lane, and Macomb, and Los Rios, and Lone Star. Dozens and dozens more across the country. We're in a partnership with the American Association of State Colleges and Universities American Democracy Project and its 242 universities in what is an uncommon alliance between state colleges and universities and our colleges. Half of the graduates of those institutions come from the community colleges. We best get to the work together. And I am delighted by the partnership and deeply indebted to George Mahaffey and Muriel Howard for what ASCU has done for us. The project has been supported and endorsed by the Association of American Community Colleges, by the League for Innovation in the Community Colleges, and by AACNU. In short, it is a coalition one year old celebrating with the American Democracy Project's 10th anniversary, 
a new beginning in what has always been the community college's fundamental mission, which is not only or singularly to prepare men and women for their work, but to prepare them to take their places as leaders in their communities and in their states and across the country. We have always understood community colleges to have a fundamental social democratic and equitable purpose. What we need to do to help them, we say in the democracy commitment, is to build new curricula, build institutional space, make it not just a public declaration, but practical on the ground projects that allow them to do their work. So what it has meant is new courses in the history of democracy at Allegheny College of Maryland, brand new uh, projects in certificate programs in community development and social change leadership at places like Minneapolis Technical and Community College at De Anza or East LA. It means new institutes like the Institute for Humanity and Democracy at Mount Wachusett. Actually, it's a misnomer to say that would be new since it's 17 years old. But from them we learned what difference it made to have an actual institutional home for this work. Whether it's in courses or programs or work in the community, what we have learned from our students and what we carry into this new coalition is the central importance of providing for the students the space for them to do their own work, to do their own organizing, for them to do democracy. And I'm enormously proud to say that as I am speaking at this moment, the students at De Anza are creating Occupy for Education, a tent city in the central quadrangle of our school. <laughs> There's a shout out to you guys at home. <laughs> Their timing actually was not to celebrate me not being there, but <laughs> that today was when the governor is releasing the state budget. They have dedicated themselves to a night a week for the next nine weeks in preparation for a march in Sacramento with students across the state. They have our support because we, in fact, need them. And together, we have to fight back against the cutbacks that are destroying their opportunities for education and development and advancement, not again just in the economy, but in their civic and community lives. They need the space to organize. They need the space to learn. They need the space to teach. What we are doing in America's community colleges with Eduardo Padron and other colleagues is we are reaching across to colleges who in their hearts have always had this mission and pulling it up into the center. So I'm delighted for today to be the day to uh, publicly announce uh, the commitment of this coalition of national community colleges to this common work. Thank you. Uh, Brian gives us the why. My little illustration in eight minutes or less is to tell you how. Uh, to give you an example of one small college, I want to do correct Jim Leach. We are not on Long Island. I want to assure those listening online who are residents of Staten Island, once again, we have not been lost. <laughs> Put your passports away. Uh, no tetanus shots. You're back in New York City. Um, we are on Staten Island, a small borough of simply 500,000 people. Uh, seemingly forgotten people, and uh, <laughs> Wagner College uh, 14 years ago made a commitment to a comprehensive required four-year undergraduate curriculum that links clusters of courses that we call in our parlance in higher education learning communities, that is several courses connected together with common cohorts of students taking the same courses together with real-world problems in terms of experiential and civic learning. So we've been at this for a while. And my little example is to show that one small, fragile uh, private college can make a fairly serious impact and that we're always mindful that we're always revising our work in light of our activity and our engagement. Uh, but this, commi this commitment has been going on for some time. Uh, we have tried to link the real world texts, or rather the real text of the class with real world problems in a way that's powerful, expands learning of our students and builds on their natural civic intuitions. For 
most of those 14 years, we were engaged in something we would call civic engagement or service learning kinds of courses. They tend to be episodic. In our case, they're structured through the freshman through the senior year, but they tend to be episodic because they end at, each, at the end of each semester. They are connected to uh, uh, roots within the community uh, where we can find them and the like. We found that wholly inadequate. Uh, so we launched several years ago in March in 2009 a community partnership with one community in Staten Island where we put about 50% of our uh, student engagement work that is curricularly driven. Again, all undergraduates go through this over the four years. Uh, that community is called Port Richmond. It's about 30,000 people. It's mostly uh, Latino, 50% a Latino, mostly undocumented Mexicans from Huaca. African Americans, about 20 or 25 percent, the rest Caucasians, mostly white working class, many of them uh, homeowners of modest homes. Uh, it's, a, it's a community of some tension. And we began working with this community, trying to, uh, asking ourselves, when we do service learning work, as we had in the past exclusively, we do good things when it's done well. Students learn more about their subject. They connect with people in the community they wouldn't normally connect with. There's learning going across from the community to the student and vice versa. You build the, the foundations for civic culture, for a sense of reci a reciprocal relationships, a sense of valuing one another, a sense of we, not just me. But it's limited, as I said, in terms of being episodic and individualistic. So we decided to build this, this, uh, this partnership with Port Richmond, taking one community of need uh, and trying to align the sustainable assets of this institution with the ongoing challenges of the community through a democratic partnership, through a cooperative democratic partnership. And we did that. We've been working at it for a couple of years now. In fact, we're trying to take it to another level. So that partnership works this way. We have over 30 courses that are aligned through all of the, all of the subjects in our curriculum with specific agencies and organizations and efforts in that community. At the moment, we're trying to say, Instead of the curriculum looking for outlets in community work, let's work closely with the community, as we have done, to identify what the challenges are and marry them back to the curriculum. So there's a true partnership built around democratic governance structures shared together. And we've done this. We've identified uh, health care issues around obesity and diabetes, which are profound in this community, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, and we have undergraduate and graduate uh, uh, nursing program and undergraduate and graduate physician assistant program. Of course, a very strong pre-med program. A good number of our students go on to medical school. Uh, we have a strong business, undergraduate and graduate business programs. Economic development is a huge issue, sp particularly small business development and microfinance for new entrepreneurs that are trying to emerge in a mostly um, uh, immigrant community. And I, I must say, an African-American community that is largely forgotten here in the mix of all of this. Uh, and of course, we have a strong commitment through a graduate, undergraduate programs in ed teacher education, which are all built on the liberal arts and arts and sciences. They're not, there's no majors in education. They are built on fundamental uh, strength in the disciplines that students are engaged in and then get certified. But those programs also are built around the notion of everything from literacy to college readiness. So, and if we think about the way we've used our science courses and our humanities courses, our history courses, performing arts courses in this community, again, all built around taking the existing sustainable assets of our curriculum and aligning them in a way that's ongoing with projects. Our goal now is we're in the middle of a strategic planning process. David Maurice is here. Margaret is working closely with us, and we're part of the Anchor Institutions Group, which has done such marvelous work across the country in community partnerships uh, and we're trying to identify then which to make sure we and verify with our community leaders and community residents that in fact we are aligning around the very issues that they find most powerful and most challenging. Uh, our goal here is to do three things. Our goal in this, in this curriculum and this effort really for 14 years and now in this new model of the partnership model is really to first of all fundamentally increase learning in the disciplines that students are taking courses in. That's fundamental. Without that, I fear that these kinds of efforts will wander. They'll, they'll fluctuate with leadership changes, with semester changes. They'll, they'll fluctuate with uh, uh, financial challenges that colleges face and universities face. But fundamentally, we have to commit to the fact that students are learning the disciplines they're studying. But that's only the necessary but not sufficient conditions. The sufficient conditions are also that they increase their civic learning what it means to be connected to publics which they will serve in the professions in which they choose. 
and they're being prepared for, both across the entire curriculum. And finally, of course, the other sufficient condition is that we're actually changing things in a community of need, that there's an impact, a measurable set of criteria annually and over a five-year period of an impact with this community on those very issues that I mentioned in terms of economic development, uh, health care, and education. And we're off to a fairly good start the last three years on this, but I'm not convinced that in and of itself um, just the just the effort will make the difference. We then brought in a number of other anchor institutions, as we call them in the anchor institution work, of local banks, foundations, corporations, elected officials across the board from members of the Conservative Party, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and a whole host of, of NGOs uh, in this community, again, to coalesce, to be the convener, the facilitator, to really make an impact with and for the community, raising the leadership level in the community and giving it a greater chance to have control over its own destiny. So that's an example of what one school is engaged in and doing. I thought I look in this audience and I can see many, many other examples that from practitioners here that I'm proud to say we're allied with. But this is an example that within the crucible moment, you can have a four-year commitment across the board to civic learning, deepening disciplinary learning as well, and of course having an impact on the community. Thank you very much. It is a great privilege and a pleasure, great pleasure to be here today. And um, I, I just wanted to tell you that um, uh, you have to excuse me. Being a novice, I just became an American citizen in 2008. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking as, as a new citizen and um, as um, someone who has come from a country where um, the government um, uh, not only welcomes uh, a meeting like this, but in fact, uh, right after the 2009 um, uh, protest by the Iranian people against the rigged uh, presidential elections in Iran, um, the first place they attacked were the universities and the humanities. They threatened to shut down all humanities departments because they said that is where West insinuates itself and, and, and misleads and, 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 you know, sort of leads our uh, youth as, astray. So as we speak, people in that country uh, are in jail. They have been flogged. They have been tortured. Some have been killed only because of the fact that they want to know. And, and, and so the first thing that came to my mind um, as you talk, Martha, about this president um, uh, welcoming um, education uh, as soon as he came to power, I thought of another president, the first president of this country. Uh, who had dreamt of having a national university on the capital, and who had said that there is nothing which can better deserve our patronage than the promotion of science and literature. Knowledge is, in every country, the surest basis of public happiness. Uh, and I felt that, well, you know, if you want to talk about the world, and if you want to talk about the gift that America has given the world, is bringing to it this sort of um, uh, mix of freedom and, and knowledge, and, and making it, in fact, very, very pragmatic. Um, again, I w wanted to bring another short quote. I, I just wish that rather than talking, I could bring just all these quotes, read all these quotes to you. Uh, but uh, of another person, uh, Frederick Douglass, actually, I wanted to tell you that, for example, Frederick Douglass's speeches and, and writings um, are used um, by, uh, uh, at least I know of one human rights organization, the Buruman Foundation for Democracy in Iran, in in order to educate um, uh, young people um, inside the country. And for those people who here today tell us that um, education um, is not pragmatic, uh, that at a time when we're going through so much e economic and, and, and political difficulties, we don't need education, um, I wanted to remind you of what he said when um, uh, they were building a school in Manassas, Virginia, uh, which was at one point the, the seat of slavery, in fact. Um, I'm just reading a very short seg segment of it. It is such a beautiful, beautiful speech. You know, reading it, you can almost hear um, the, the sort of the tremors and the, the trembling of excitement um, in his words as, as, as he says this. Uh, about, and, and the title of it is Blessings of Liberty and, and Education. And he says to educate the hand as well as the brain to teach man to work as well as to think, and to think as well as to work. I mean, you know, if, what more can you say? 
in response to anyone who tries to separate the brain from the hand, the work um, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from knowledge. And, and, and so I just thought that um, in this very short minutes, most probably I spent um, four minutes already, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I bring to you two of my personal experiences uh, to, to make my point um, about what it means uh, to be in the world today, what it means to be part of the global um, community uh, as an American. Uh, because to, for us to feel safe and secure and prosperous, we need to help the world to become a safer and a more secure and a more prosperous country. And, and we need allies around the world who also believe with us um, about, uh, you know, the, in the same principle. And, and, and the same values. And I remember that um, a few weeks ago, I was talking to two of my students. Actually, they are in reading Lolita in Tehran. They were my star students. Uh, in that book, I called them Mana and Nima. And we were talking to them here in Washington, D.C., and we were talking about our memories of Iran. And they were reminding me of how, at that time, when they were being flogged, they were being virginity tests for walking down the streets wearing their weapons of mass destruction, which was sort of showing their hair um, holding hands with someone um, they loved or, or listening to music, um, um, reading banned books. For all of that, they were being punished that at that time when they were disconnected to the world, they connected to the world, and, and especially they connected to this country uh, through its golden ambassadors. Um, in my classes, we, um, we couldn't show it in, at the universities, but uh, you know, we would hand them um, forbidden videos of um, Marx Brothers um, and, and, and of Casablanca and, uh, and as a, uh, of Woody Allen, and we would be reading um, Saul Bellow and Edgar Allan Poe and Hawthorne and Toni Morrison and, and, and Ralph Ellison. These were the subversive elements, and, and, I, and I'm saying this, I'm reminding you of this, because both Frederick Lagras and those who live in China or who live in Iran or who used to live in the former uh, Soviet Union um, and, and, and the uh, Eastern European countries, those of them, understand for them the relationship between liberty and education is not just words. That they have felt it with their flesh and blood. That they understand it with their flesh and blood. And for them, America was beloved not because of its military might, not because of its weapon that nowadays anybody can acquire, and not even just for its technology, but for its culture of democracy. That that is what threatens tyrants around the world, as well as fascinates them. We were talking before about how China is trying to have liberal arts colleges. They're coming to us, to our liberal arts colleges over here, asking how they can have a liberal arts college. Of course, as soon as they think about it, they realize that without liberty, you can't have a liberal arts college. Or you were talking about Slovakia, how, how, how now our colleges are working in Slovakia, how to educate people. Even Saudi Arabia wants to tell us that they, they're going to move Louvre, you know, or move our museums and our universities into those countries because that is what matters to the world. And, and so what I wanted to say about these two students was that another thing that they said that really broke my heart was that they said, you remember how much, you know, my classes would be flooded. People would come from all over um, Tehran and the suburbs uh, to hear um, to talk about Henry Fielding or, or, or Saul Bellow or Emily Dickinson. You know, and, and they were saying that now that we're here, one of them was writing on Elizabeth Bishop and another on Zbigniew Herbert, and they said we can't find anyone who's interested in it in English, so we are again writing in Farsi. We are again writing in Persian. And that was what broke my heart, and it brought me to my second um, experience that I uh, wanted to talk about for a moment. I, was, I think it was the first or the second term I, when I returned here and I was teaching at SAIS and I was teaching a, a graduate class um, on the relationship between civilizations and I very casually remarked something about de Tocqueville. And one blue-eyed, uh, blonde-haired girl put up her hand and said, who is de Tocqueville? Now, I'm not trying to use that woman, poor girl, I've been using her all over the place, uh, everywhere I go, uh, but, but I want to give her um, the sort of credit. I'm sure that in that class there were many who, like her, did not know who Dutokville was, but they did not have the curiosity you know, and the courage to, in fact, put their hands up and want to know. But that question 
made me think that in order for us to know the world, to connect to the world, to view the world properly, we need to first know ourselves, connect to ourselves, and understand ourselves. And how could a young population, without having any knowledge of their own history, of their own culture, of their own literature, how can they stand confident? And how can they face the, the um, uh, world with all the com uh, its complexities and, 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 and contradictions and difficulties that it offers us? How can we feel any form of empathy for a woman in Afghanistan who is um, killed, in fact, because she wants to go to school? Or a woman in Egypt, as we speak today, who is given a virginity test because she protests? Or a woman in Darfur um, who has been raped several times and her children have been killed in front of her eyes? How can we empathize with, our, with them if we cannot empathize with ourselves? How can we lead the world or be part of the world? Not, I mean, you know, market and jobs are related to life. You make money, you want to become successful because there should be passion. And what these colleges, what my colleagues here and almost everyone in this room does is in fact bring to us that curiosity about the world, the desire to know, the desire to look at ourselves through the alternative eyes of the other. And through that, it brings us empathy. And that is why we will then care about Afghanistan or Slovakia uh, or any other part of the world. And that is then why we will care about poverty in this country and why that people uh, in this country um, who, who protest about the way they live, they should not simply go and get a job and take a bath. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I should... Now I'm, I'm going, coming to, uh, to the uh, end of uh, what I wanted um, to say. And I wanted to, before coming to the end, um, everyone brings statistics, and I think that statistics are, in fact, important. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to tell you about our relationship to the world in terms of our colleges. There are th 305 million Americans. Only 0.27% volunteer going abroad, and only 0.13% volunteer with um, international organizations within this country. 22% have passports. 9% speak a second language. Most of our, our universities have eliminated now. Uh, Spanish or, or um, uh, French or German alongside of theater and music and arts. And, and, and I have been traveling across this country. I was counting the other day at least 34 states. And I've been talking to high school students. I've been speaking at co community colleges, at, uh, you know, at all sorts of different places. And one of the things that, again, and I keep thinking, in this business, your heart keeps being broken no matter where you live. Because here then, I have at the end of almost each talk, students come to me and say, you know, I have been encouraged to go and learn Arabic or, or Persian uh, so that I can be hired by the State Department. I don't want to learn Arabic or Persian because I have passion to know because I want to know about other countries, because I want to know about those ancient places, because I want to discover the world and contribute to the world. But in order to be hired for a job, do you think that anyone will be, do a job, will be doing a good job if they do not go to learn Arabic and Persian because they want to know? No one will do a good job. We can never have a good strategy about these other countries if we don't know them, if we don't empathize with them, if we genuinely are not involved with them. And that is the problem that many of the students in this country are facing to them. Some of them come to me and they talk as if they're doing a very daring and courageous job, uh, you know, act. They say, we have been told by our parents and we have not been encouraged by the school to go into English literature and philosophy, but we're going to. You know, as if this is something really, you know, amazing that they are doing and it needs, uh, you know, uh, applause. And it does need applause. But what I want uh, to end then is our commitment to these students 
And, and when we talk about democracy, we're also talking about democracy in different fields. A university cannot be reduced to a corporation in the same manner that a corporation cannot be reduced into a university. That all these different fields and structures and areas in a democratic society should work autonomously and interdependently. And the place of the uni uh, university is to encourage knowledge, to encourage each student to have a bite of that apple. Uh, and, and no innovation, no new technology will come if we do not encourage our children to have that passion and that curiosity and that thirst for knowledge. Don't think that people in Iran or in China or in um, Zimbabwe or in um, 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 Burma are not interested uh, or do not have the talent to be innovators. What they lack is that freedom, that liberty, that freedom of imagination that would make them work. And, and, and that is what we need to encourage here, and that is the gift that we can give the world, and that is the, world, the gift that the world will give to us, reminding us of, of, of the best that we can offer. Uh, so what I wanted to sort of end with, um, I, I kept um, thinking, should I end with this or not? Uh, my students... Um, also reminded me one of the last um, authors we read uh, was Saul Bellow. And, and Bellow was very worried about the future of this country. And, and he would say, those who survived the ordeal of Holocaust, how will they survive the ordeal of freedom? Because if we read Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and, and Sojourner Truth and um, Jefferson and, 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 and Washington, we know that freedom is an ordeal. And he used to say that what threatens this country is its sleeping consciousness and is its atrophy of feeling. And that is what our colleges are supposed to be doing, to fight our sleeping consciousness and to fight that atrophy of feeling. And that is why they need to be linked to the communities. They need to involve the students and the community in the kind of discussions that we are having today. They need to support all those uh, kith and kins and cousins that they have within their organizations like National Endowment for Humanities and the Arts, like the museums, like the libraries, like the bookstores. They need to be organically um, related to them. And I want to end by what nowadays I end every talk that I have. Um, is about this vision that I talked about since 2008. And I think that this is an appropriate place to talk about it. Mm, I had always imagined that we'll have hundreds of thousands of people coming from different parts of the country. And they feel from Jefferson Monument right through the mall and, you know, the pride and joy and the jewel of this city, which is the Smithsonian that celebrates the best that this country and the best that this world has offered, the best involvement that this country has had in the world. And from the Smithsonian, go right up to the Capitol, maybe sort of move towards the White House, and not protest, but to launch the way Carol is launching, a national conversation, asking ourselves, who is going to bail out imagination and thought? Thank you. It sort of reminds me of the old uh, blues line, you don't miss your water till your world runs dry. Um, and as an immigrant from uh, a country that uh, also has uh, experienced loss of freedom at times in its history, I can certainly relate to that. Uh, well, thank you to all the panelists for a very stimulating set of presentations. Um, and I'm going to ask you now to step off the stage with, with our main great thanks as I introduce the second panel. Thank you. <laughs> Our second panel discussion, Changing Lives, Changing Communities, will be led by David Matthews, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Kettering Foundation, a nonprofit operating foundation rooted in the American tradition of cooperative research with the primary research question, what does it take to make democracy work as it should? So I would ask the panelists now to come uh, and take their seat. Prior to working at the Kettering Foundation, uh, 
Uh, Mr. Matthews served as the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Ford Administration, where he worked to help restore the public's confidence in government. We're delighted to have David lead this conversation. Please welcome David Matthews and this wonderful group of students and educators. Seeing so many of you in this audience who've been at the Kettering Foundation, I'm moved to thank you again for what we've learned from you and from the members of the National Issues Forum Institute. I think our panelists would rather have the time for their remarks as opposed to an introduction. Uh, they are identified in the material. I can testify that they are as presented. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'll only make four introductory comments. First, the good news. Higher education is reaching out. Democracy is a common term now. That wasn't true in 1976. We had a conference on trends in higher education, leading intellectuals of the country, Margaret Mead. The requisite number of college and university presidents and luminaries from one DuPont to make it an auspicious occasion. <laughs> but nobody, nobody said anything about democracy. We could not have had the conference you are having now then, even though that was the 20th anniversary of American democracy. And I think what this change gives us is an opportunity to recall that higher education was a movement before it was a set of institutions to be managed and ordered. What's Worrisome is that what we mean by democracy is not disclosed. So I was at a conference on democracy a few years ago, higher education's responsibility. President of one of our leading institutions who was a political scientist, got up and said, my institution serves democracy simply by being. L'etat moi. End of the conversation. Okay. Oh, I, I don't think we'll ever have any universally accepted notion of what democracy means. In fact, uh, debate over what democracy is, is one of the characteristics of a democracy. But perhaps we owe it to one another and the cause we serve to share with one another what we do mean by the word and by its implications. And I hope the panel upcoming can contribute to that. We're living in a time when there's a contest over the meaning of democracy. A few years ago, it was rather subtle. Now it's in the streets of Cairo and around the world. It's in our own streets with people who like to drink tea and occupy streets. <laughs> it's a serious matter. 
And the key to it, the key to what we mean by democracy or will come to, democracy will come to mean in the 21st century is control by the way we understand the role of citizens. And there's a real opportunity now to have democracy light. Democracy without citizens. You know, the wonderful thing about polls is that they can make the public present and absent at the same time. You know what the people are thinking, but they can't do anything about it. Democracy light. So I've asked the panel to comment on two questions as they give our presentation. Tell us, tell us what problem caused you to do what you're doing. What was the problem? And was it a problem in democratic society? And there are many of those, and they're very serious, crime, uh, poverty. But, but what, or was it a problem of democracy itself? A problem behind the problem, something that kept or would keep democracy from working as it should. For example, we're visited by one today. The loss of confidence in our major institutions. Okay? Some more than others, but very few even warrant a 50% confidence rate. And those include institutions of higher education. The lack of legitimacy is a problem not simply in a democratic society. It's a problem of democracy itself. And then when you tell us about what problem prompted you to do what you were doing, could you tell us what role citizens are to play in democracy as you envision it? What are they to do and how do they do it? And what does what you do relate to what you think they ought to do. So now, without further ado, our panel, which we will take in the order in which they are seated. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege for me to be with all of you. I'm Molly John from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I am also a representative of the land-grant university system here, along with one of our students, Dantrell Cotton. And so to the challenge, um, problems in democracy. The problems that brought me into the roles I've played in my university life, in my civic life, um, which includes federal service, recent federal service at the U U.S. Department of Agriculture, those are problems that are very familiar to the land-grant tradition. Agriculture, food systems, food security, nutritional security, diet-related health, environmental issues relating to natural resource sufficiency, and new frontiers climate change. We um, saw so beautifully expressed in the first panel the linkages between these problems in democracy and problems of democracy. Of course, the land-grant tradition was literally invented to manage this dialogue. I've recently concluded service as dean of one of America's premier land-grant colleges of agriculture. And it never was this far from my mind because at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in front of the Dean's office is a plaque entitled Agrarian Democracy. Those who walk up the steps to the Dean's office walk by that plaque. And in fact, we are a campus as our sister campuses are deeply committed to that legacy and to the future of those obligations we hold to this nation and to the world. So the problems of democracy that are paramount for me in the various roles I play 
are familiar challenges. They are the challenges of empowerment of Democrats. That is all of us, all citizens. We have a tradition of what you might call very energized political dialogue in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> I am very proud to say that I serve a provost and chancellor, a university system president, and sister campuses across our University of Wisconsin um, network that takes that commitment very seriously and has for a very long time under a concept we're extremely proud of called the Wisconsin Idea. Nearly a century old or older, depending on who you listen to, this is an explicit commitment that the boundaries of our institution are the boundaries of the state. That was back when you rode horses. We understand that, as do our sister land-grant colleges and universities, to now be a global commitment of the most profound nature. And it is a commitment to partnership. And so citizens um, and the role citizens play are our full partners. And I am, as an individual and as a representative of my institution and the legacy of the land-grant system, I am a partner. I am a partner with our students, Dan Trell Cotton and his future, his colleagues' future. I am a partner of an, a very special institution that is part of how Dan Trell came to be sitting next to me, the Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences, a literally unique high school on the south side of Chicago, a public high school that exemplifies the very values that you are here to advocate for. That is meaningful, consequential work for the likes of Dan Trout and his colleagues. We have two students from that high school here, the principal, vice principal, and a master ag teacher, all here to learn your language of citizenship and democracy and to share with you our commitment. We think we're from the ag world, but we hold a legacy that is critically important to the work you're doing. I am a partner to the other land-grant institutions the 1890 land-grant system, the 1994 land-grant system. My, my partners are our tribes. They are our urban institutions. They are, um, they are our global partners. I hold an adjunct professorship at Seoul National University. Next week, I'll be in Mexico City, later this spring in Egypt and Israel, talking about food security, climate change, nutritional security prosperity, security, and economic future that is, um, that is defensible in light of a word we spend a lot of time thinking about, which is sustainability. I'm a partner. We are keepers of a legacy established by President Lincoln, whose likeness sits atop Bascom Hill in Madison, Wisconsin, looking from our administrative building to our capital. The politics, the policies, the specific personal commitments we hold to not only our medium, which is um, familiar, but to these ideals, these commitments, for the last 150 years under the vision of the Morrill Act and for the next 150 years. So don't forget, please, about the land-grant university system and its special obligation to the topics of interest to us here today. I thank you very much for the invitation to be with you, and it is my great honor and pleasure to hand the microphone to the 2010 valedictorian of Chicago High School for Ag Sciences. I got to be his commencement speaker, Dan Trell Cotton. Thank you, Dr. John, and I'm elated to be here in front of all of you representing a college student, a successful college student, who is a, exemplifying the means of democracy. Now, uh, the title of today is For Democracy's Future, and earlier we mentioned that we are a democracy, so it's really for my future and, and others like me, college students, the students that we're here talking about, for um, all, all those here, for the panelists. Um, I. As she mentioned, I, I'm a recent graduate from uh, an agricultural high school in the south side of Chicago, Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences. And, and one thing that we 
often talk about is this model of sustainability, but I'm going to tweak the definition that I use and apply it to democracy. And, and I feel like sustainability is very important in sustaining what we uh, envision for successful democracy. So in, in my definition of it, it's living together in our material comfort, all the things that we have, the things that we work hard for, what we save our money for, what we get our education for, um, peacefully with each other. How do we coincide, coexist with each other? Um, work with, whether it's on different political fronts, different religious fronts, dif different uh, ethnic groups. How do we uh, live in that material comfort, peacefully with each other, within the means of democracy? And, and that's, that's my view of um, sustainability and some of the things that I'm trying to work uh, working on at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, alongside with Dr. John. Um, but one of the problems that I, I was that I wrote that I find um, that's as with democracy is I feel that we misdiagnose causes and effects. Um, and one big thing that I'm talking about is in our educational system, as uh, most in panel one was talking about. I feel that. Um, often there's, there's um, talks and there's countless meetings on low test scores, uh, apathy for my generation, uh, the millennials, generation Y, for participation and their civic duty. Um, and that's often viewed as the cause, but, um, it's, but if you really think about it, it's most of the things that people like Dr. John was talking about. It's, that return to civics, why aren't we teaching that in our classrooms? Um, why, you know, there's just a month ago, and before I was leaving for this semester, we had a, a, like a pop quiz in one of my classes, in one of our dialogue classes, and there's so many things um, that those who want to be citizens in the United States now have, to, like the test that they have to take, that most of us did not know. There's things like, who wrote the, national anthem, and, and small things like that that make up our, what, what we call essentially our democracy that, that we didn't know. So, and many things, I think the problem is that, um, especially for my generation, is that we take things for granted. And we think that just because we're born here, we don't have to know the basics. And the return to the basics is how we're gonna solve many of the problems in the future. Um, and, and the second thing is a return and also an absence in, in many regards in our educational system of an empowerment principle and uh, also known as an inclusion principle. How do we empower students like myself um, by valuing, valuing our ideas? How do you make people say that we're listening to your ideas? We, we know you're the future. So how do we um, take your ideas into account? And then second, second part of the empowerment is first you empower, then you involve. You, you try to put some of those into play you know, by community service, letting them be more active in their school settings or in the, uh, the college. How do you have more partnerships with the campus and community? And third is participation. Um, using students to uh, empower each other. Uh, I was sharing a story yesterday that, they, yesterday that oftentimes um, we're asked who our role models are. And a lot of people say like the famous names like Oprah or some movie star. And I... And <laughs> As great as that is, I always say it's the person sitting next by me because you, you, you see their struggle, you see how they're defining, um, how they're overcoming many of their challenges and their obstacles. And in turn, that's part of democracy in itself also. It's not just, democracy isn't just the good things that come out of everything that we do, it's, it's those setbacks. Because if you think about it, our country was founded on setback after setback after setback, which is why people left and came here. So um, many of those problems there is, is, is what I find can be a problem in um, why there's a halt in democracy. And that's why I myself personally take uh, responsibility is trying to educate my peers on ways that we can be more informed. And first step is getting an education. And education isn't just um, through book knowledge. It's getting an education outside the classroom. Um, in my high school experience, uh, we, we, I do a lot of agricultural work. So it's how do you get, con like just like I'm getting connected to the soil, how do we get other students connected to those roots? How do we get them back into the community? Um, one thing that I find is you find a lot of students, um, they leave their communities to go to a college or to go to a higher level of education, yet they never return. 
And how do you empower that next generation to make a difference if they don't see any successful models coming back to say, hey, look at me, I'm a success story. So that's some of the things that, um, that I find can be problematic when, when questioning where the future of democracy is going. Um, and also, we, we touched upon it earlier in, in panel one, and I thank you guys so much. Diversity is a big issue, um, whether it's diversity ethnically, but the diversity of mindsets is important. Um, ideas, how do we get students, I think it's very, very important. Some of the success that I see uh, at, at, the, at the university is the classes where students get to have an open dialogue about many issues, whether it's religious or um, the issues on politics, cultural bringing all those, infusing those together so that they can talk and discuss. And sometimes arguing isn't the worst thing. I mean, we see it all. We're in Washington, D.C. So all I learned, <laughs> most of what I learned in my civic classes is that you, you're going to have set arguments and setbacks after setbacks. But as I wrote in one of my pieces for Democracy U, you have to put those fear aside, your fear of not saying what um, everyone wants to hear. But you have to, you have to put your ideas on the table in hopes that someone will hear. And, and sometimes, um, for me, democracy isn't always having a consensus. It's just having that one listening ear sometimes. If someone's saying, you're going somewhere with that. And that's part of that empowerment process that I was talking about earlier. Um, and one thing, another thing is, uh, in the Crucible, this um, moments highlight, they say that 36% of college students agreed that uh, faculty um, publicly advocate for the need for civic participation. That's a low number. And one, one reason that I noticed just as a, as a college student now is that how am I supposed to be empowered if we don't see empowerment from those who are educating us? Because they, um, just like babies, you mirror what you see. You mirror what you, so if I have an educator who's just teaching, what, what am I learning for? Am I just learning to reach the state bar, or am I trying to reach a certain statistic, or am I learning, as mentioned earlier, so I can be passionate about it? Do I want to learn so I can actually make a difference in my community? So that's one thing um, that, uh, that I, I feel are some problems in democracy, and those are some things that I'm trying to change now. So thank you. <laughs> My name is Nikki Cooley. I'm from the Diné Nation, better known as the Navajo Nation. I come from 17 million acres of land where 80% of the people do not have electricity or running water. Just in 2011, my parents got electricity. No running water yet. We still have to haul it 50 miles round trip. Um, I come from that type of environment where I, that was my space. And then I went to a boarding school, not the swanky kind, a military style run boarding school where I did not like science, I did not like math. I went to high school at Flag High, um, Flagstaff, Arizona, and I stayed in the dorm for um, students, Native American students. I still did not like math or science. I just, th it was boring, I didn't get it. Tutors tried to help me <laughs> ineffectively. So how did I end up with a master's degree in forestry? And I work with climate scientists, and I travel all over working, and, uh, working with scientists of all ages. And um, how, did, how did that happen? And um, I asked myself that question, and I realized that I had opportunities that were relevant to my background that used my background as a Navajo woman whose first language is Navajo, who thinks in Navajo, and um, is concerned about issues on the Navajo reservation and other native communities, because that is who I am first and foremost. And I went through a couple of programs that I, where I got to work with the Cherokee people in North Carolina, working on fire science, and I combined qualitative and quantitative methods. And that was my light bulb moment. I said, now I understand why I need to know math and science. That is how I make it relevant. And um, so that is how I got to where I am now. And, there, and um, 
I work with, I work on a climate science project where we're working on a curriculum that where we're incorporating relevant models of climate change on the Colorado Plateau. I don't know if that's been done before. And if I had that when I was in high school, I think I might have been more inclined to retain that information or, or to be interested or to stay awake even in class. <laughs> so that is, uh, one of th that is where I come from and to answer the first question. Um, and the, that leads to the question of, lack of um, uh, the lack of empowerment, the lack of relevant opportunities in the science technology, engineering, and math mathematical fields, STEM education. So that, that is what I would, I would say, that it is so important for you educators, and since we're at the White House, to the government, to the politicians, that relevant cultural educational opportunities are so important. I come from a state that, has, uh, that made uh, learning Spanish illegal. English only state that is not there are multiple ways of learning multiple ways of knowing so I encourage all you educators politicians and the US Department of Education since you guys are here that there are multiple ways of knowing and learning please keep that in mind when it comes to democratize democ democracy in the universities and college so thank you very much Hi, uh, I'm Ram Coles, uh, and I'm a professor at NAU, Northern Arizona State University, and I direct the program for community culture and the environment. Um, uh, in terms of the problem that has led me uh, down the road uh, pathway that I'm on, I think it, I would describe it as a failure of imagination uh, and a failure of involvement, democratic involvement, democratic agency, that I discovered. I, I, I was at Duke University. I taught political theory for 20 years before uh, coming to Northern Arizona University. And though uh, everybody who gets into Duke has top scores and grades, um, what was a real struggle teaching, um, there was a, a, a failure of imagination, especially when uh, thinking about political theory, where you're really trying to get people to expand uh, their sense of possibility, think carefully beyond the boxes um, that they um, inherit unthinkingly. Um, and so, you know, that's always a challenge. It's, all, it's especially a challenge with people who are straight-A students but still can't really think. Um, and so there was that problem that coexisted with a, a, a problem that um, within a quarter of a mile of Duke University on, on several sides, um, there were very poor communities of people people who lived um, with none of the privileges that most of the students at Duke had. And, um, and there was very, very little crossing of these boundaries. In fact, there were people who didn't even know that a third of a mile away there was a community that had uh, some serious problems um, uh, around which um, relationships might form. So. Um, I, uh, and then there was a problem among colleagues um, who were similarly unimaginative, I think, because we were uh, cut off in an Ivy League tower. So increasingly, I became involved in a, in a variety of uh, interfaith efforts and different community efforts, and, and I found uh, that my own imagination, um, my imagination, my thinking, um, was, uh, was electrified in those uh, settings, revivified in those settings, more than when I went to to the American Political Science Association annual meeting, believe it or not. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so I increasingly began to change my pedagogy at Duke and teach more engaged uh, uh, kinds of courses that, that really cultivated civic agency, cultivated long-term relationships with different community groups and, and so forth. And, and what I found is uh, that students became alive uh, uh, in multiple ways in that setting. They began to uh, read 
Tocqueville, Plato, Augustine, uh, Dewey, um, very differently and, and in much more creative ways. They began to, on their own, um, generate a whole variety of, of uh, civic relationships and projects and, and sustain them. Um, and uh, so I became convinced that uh, the place where I could think the best uh, and help others um, and be involved, uh, engage, develop civic agency and public work would be at an institution like uh, Northern Arizona University, which really has a deep um, identity around its civic mission, around being a steward of its place. And uh, so I made that move a few years ago. Um, what we've been doing to, uh, I suppose, to move to the second question, what we've been uh, working on um, in the past few years, although this work goes back long before um, my arriving there. Um, we've been working on uh, an e what I would call an ecological approach to cultivating um, the democratic mission, the democratic identity of the university. By ecological approach, I uh, don't mean actually so much um, things that we work on like climate change, food systems, energy, and so forth. By ecological approach, I mean that we're, we're approaching the, uh, the question of institutional institutional change for it, uh, to revitalize the democratic mission by looking at the campus as an ecology, um, an ecology that involves curricular pieces, learning environment pieces, uh, faculty working groups, a whole set of um, uh, new sites and modes of learning with interfaith groups, with um, uh, multiple uh, Native American uh, reservations across uh, northern Arizona, um, with a, a whole slew of elementary, middle, and high schools, and so on and so forth. That these are sites of learning. So, they, so what we're doing is decenter our sense of where learning happens, with whom it happens, how it happens, um, and developing this ecology. We're also really working on developing a whole set of Professor public Coles. spaces. For example, um, me, Professor Coles, I'm sorry, stop. I have the unpleasant task of having to uh, call time. We More are on this running later. way behind. So I'm going to ask the remaining panelists to, to, to take two minutes for their piece. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, Paul Markham, I'm at Western Kentucky University, Institute for Citizenship and Social Responsibility. Uh, two minutes. So uh, uh, we believe just enough of this stuff <clears throat> to be dangerous, right, <laughs> in Kentucky, right? So uh, uh, you know, if you haven't noticed, Kentucky is kind of a conservative place, right? And uh, so when we think about the kinds of problems that we have, you know, in this case of democracy, uh, taking, you know, uh, our cues from folks like Harry Boyd, Center of Democracy and Citizenship. Uh, and myself as an educator, very passionate about not only educating university students, but also connecting university students to secondary, to primary, which is a key goal of our state. Right? And we've done lots and lots of work on the topic of the achievement gap. Right? Hear it all the time, the achievement gap. But, uh, but in terms of what we most deeply want to address, it's much like what you've already heard over and over again, is to address the empowerment gap. Uh, I will just say that through our, a public achievement program is what we do, and it is about allowing young people to identify issues that is important to them, issues that are important to them, they care very much about, and we don't let them then say, I care about this, it's broken, now you fix it, <laughs> right? We won't let them do that because we'll say, no, you can. You can do it. We will help you do it. We are a coach. We, sit, we stand beside you, uh, and we'll coach you through the process of addressing it. And uh, we have here uh, Bianca Brown, who is one of our senior coaches, uh, who does an, an excellent job. And I'm just going to hand the mic over to her and let her tell, her, tell you a little bit about what she does. Thank you, Dr. Markham. Two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to do a rapid fire. Um, what can the citizen do or what is our citizen task? I think it's to share the knowledge that you have and empower the unempowered. That sounds really like poetic, but I guess my point is that it's not enough to just uh, hang an American flag in front of your home and call yourself a citizen, right? In our public achievement groups, we asked our students 
uh, pretty much really early on in the sessions, what is citizenship? Uh, what's enough? And they say, voting, doing stuff, you know, doing stuff, voting. But they get the idea, it's activity, right? They get that point, they might not know that word yet, but they know that it's an action. It's not just saying, I'm an American. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. It's a great privilege of ours to be able to say that. But what does it mean in the act of doing? It's the act of doing things. And achieving an, or obtaining knowledge and going to higher education is a, a wonderful thing that we're able to, to have. Uh, people like, you know, um, Dantel and Nikki and other students, um, especially if you come from a place where it's really difficult for someone in a socioeconomic status to achieve that higher education. But what do you do when you get there? It's really awesome to have like a 4.0 and graduate and all, and to go out into the workforce and say, okay, give me a CEO position. But is that engagement, is that fulfilling? It might be to some people. Um, personally, um, I found more purpose in my life when I was directed by Dr. Markham, and I took, he asked me earlier, what was it that changed for you, what click? And I said, it was taking the first class with you. You know, I want to be like you when I grow up. You know, he's been a real inspiration to me. I needed that support to, to show me you have a voice that matters. You can be engaged in things that, that uh, are important to you. He might not always like what I have to say, but I know through knowing him that what I have to say at least needs to be said. So, empowering and empowered. Thank you very much for all of you for your very stimulating presentations. I'm going to ask you now to step down. And I'd like to introduce, oh yeah, give him another hand. I'd like to introduce next Harry Boyd, who is founder and director of the Center for Democracy and Citizenship at Augsburg, Augsburg College and of the American Commonwealth Partnership, which is being announced here today. Harry has been instrumental in civic work over many decades and in helping to plan this event. He is going to introduce a video that will help frame the discussion for the breakout sessions. Please offer a warm welcome to Harry Boyd. I think we may have problems with time that are going to skip the, video. skip the video. This is a shame. I don't know if it's going to be archived. It's a great video. Yes, it will, be archived. will it be archived? Um, yeah, we worked on this video. Um, okay, so I want to say how pleased I am to be here. This is an historic day. Uh, the American Commonwealth Partnership is seven months old. Um, it's a broad, diverse coalition of colleges, universities, schools, civic groups uh, in partnership with the Department of Education and the Office of Public Engagement. We've helped put together this event. Um, I want to thank Nancy Cantor. Um, and Brian Murphy, who are co-chairs of our president's group, uh, Paul uh, Pribenow, who has offered to host the American Commonwealth Partnership at Augsburg College going forward for the next uh, two or three years, uh, George Mahaffey, and all the other partners. George is vice president of the uh, state colleges and universities and a great, uh, a great partner in really developing a deeper sense of the higher education civic mission. So let me just make a couple of remarks about what the American Commonwealth Partnership is. Um, this is the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act. It's been alluded to several times. The Morrill Act created land grants in 1862 at a time of crisis in the nation. And as they developed, they became understood in terms of their identity as democracy colleges. University of Minnesota in the 1930s saw itself and students and faculty saw themselves as in a democracy college. The American Commonwealth Partnership in another time of crisis and drift and division and anxiety about the future sees our role as multiplying democracy colleges for the 21st century across the entire landscape of education. Not only land grant public universities, but liberal arts schools, community colleges, research universities, state colleges and universities, community colleges. We see ourselves, in a sense, 
as responding to the call of the nation, just as the land grants the first time around responded to the call of the nation, responding to the crisis of the nation. There is a deep sense in America that we need to move from a me culture to a much more we culture, that we need to reinvent 21st century citizenship, and that that's a question of identity, not marginal after hours activity. And that is the mission of the American Commonwealth Partnership to take this forward in many forms. You'll read in the packet of commitments a lot of different initiatives. I'm not going to go over them. I want to note five different ways we see 21st century uh, democracy colleges developing. First, they are colleges that welcome and intentionally develop full participation and diversity. They see the need for many different kinds of knowledge and people to interact at the very core of what it means to be an institution of education. Secondly, they are built around the notion of what we call civic agency, or put differently, pedagogies of empowerment. In the last panel, you heard some examples of that. They're very powerful stories. I hope we'll be able to get some of the, of the videos uh, streamed, because they're, as, you can, as those who've seen it know, they're powerful, moving stories of empowerment tied to learning. We heard several stories that are just the tip of the iceberg here. Thirdly, we believe that democracy colleges for the 21st century need to be grounded in local ecologies, which don't make higher education on top, but as part of the mix with many different institutions and groups and families and networks um, working together. Fourthly, we need colleges and universities which are accountable. The idea of developing um, impact assessment. The American Democracy Project is birthing a project to look at the impact of colleges on the, camp on the communities in which they're located. And that's a whole different kind of ranking system. And finally, we need higher education institutions which are dedicated deeply to public scholarship, to knowledge about the world, for the world, and with the world. That involves a conception of science itself, which is in conversation with other kinds of knowledge. We heard stories from the Ag School and from Northern Arizona about what it means to teach science in an empowering way, not as a hectoring instructional pedagogy, but as an empowering pedagogy. We are working also on the very foundations of science itself as appropriately and usefully in dialogue with other kinds of knowledge, a narrative, a cultural, a meaning-making understanding of the human person. Science itself is political in its very constitution. So we're going forward. We don't know exactly the shape of democracy colleges of the 21st century. We know we need them if we are to see a rebirth of citizenship, if higher education is to respond to the call of the nation. And I would say this is ultimately about what Martin Luther King, who shaped me as a young man, I worked for SCLC when I was a college student. Dr. King used to, in the letter from a Birmingham jail, articulated a vision of a me-first culture when he said, we are bound together in the single garment of destiny uh, tied in an inescapable network of mutuality. And that's what we need to re-knit together through our work and our learning and our interactions with the world. That is the call and the challenge and the promise of education in the 21st century. Thank you, Harry, for those stirring words. I'm going to introduce now Kyle Lerman, who, from the Office of Public Engagement, who will, has some instructions for you on how to get to the breakout sessions. Oh, we're gonna do the video? Do the video? Okay. All right. And it'll be archived. Good afternoon. One of the most important purposes of educating our nation's youth and adults is to preserve and strengthen our democracy. Unfortunately, civic learning opportunities are often disconnected from the core academic mission of too many of our colleges, universities, and schools. Everyone who has come together at the White House this afternoon shares a common vision that students need to learn about and immerse themselves in civic learning and engagement opportunities. 
In doing so, democracy's future will be assured now and for generations to come. But the task before us to make this happen throughout our education system is great. Going forward, let's each of us make it a top priority to ensure commitments from institutions, schools, companies, foundations, and organizations throughout our communities to identify the most promising methods and research to promote civic learning and democratic engagement in K-12 and higher education. We must take action to deepen our nation's civic identity through education and find ways to advance civic learning across the education spectrum. As a community, we must expand our understanding of the importance of democratic engagement through new public scholarship and research and use evidence-based decision-making to drive our reforms. And we must build and strengthen the connections between our campuses and our communities to extend civic learning into every aspect of our students' lives. Today's meeting is a continuation of decades-long discussions with a call to action for all of us to do more, to harness our collective intelligence and energy for democracy's future. And I'm excited to join you in this work. Now let me introduce my colleagues who have worked tirelessly to bring us together, who are now ready to enrich our national conversation. If we as Americans are to regain collective control over our future, we need to reinvent citizenship. Higher education has crucial roles to play, educating citizens, helping to build flourishing communities. This year is the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act, which created land-grant colleges, once known as democracy colleges. The American Commonwealth Partnership is a new coalition promoting the Morrill Act's civic mission throughout all of education. We call for a shift from scattered civic activity to strong civic identity in families, schools, professions, colleges, and universities. And we're organizing a national conversation on how to make this happen. Our question, how to work as agents of democracy on campuses and in communities to reinvent citizenship. Today, the Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement Network is releasing its national report, A Crucible Moment, College Learning and Democracy's Future. It calls on higher education to make civic learning expected of every student, rather than optional only for some. The Association of American Colleges and Universities and its network partners are working to advance education that produces constructive civic problem solvers able to navigate differences to reach shared goals. Such knowledge enhances learning, workplace skills, college persistence, and citizenship. But there is a serious civic learning gap. It can be closed if a civic ethos governs campus life, civic inquiry is infused across the curriculum, and civic action becomes lifelong practice. Our question is how can campuses make civic learning pervasive, not peripheral, practical, not abstract, and found in all subjects of study? Over the last decade, we've seen a proliferation of engaged learning practices, community partnerships, and public scholarship. But in a time of budget constraints, colleges and universities now need to make the case that civic engagement matters to students, to the communities, and to the wider democracy. To make that case, we need to ask, what are the policies, programs, and practices that are most likely to increase students' civic skills, the same skills that employers say they want, and how can we increase the ability for students to demonstrate their civic knowledge and engagement? We need to ask how can we go deeper with the evidence we already have to understand the full extent of students' civic capacities and competencies. And finally, we need to ask how can we ensure that these outcomes are not reserved for the most privileged students who can seek out particular experiences, but rather are expected and available to all students regardless of institutional type, sector, or size. Our question is how can higher education become more intentional about whether and how civic learning and democratic engagement make a difference to students' lives, the vitality of our communities, and the success of our institutions. In 2002, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities created the concept that our 400 colleges and universities are stewards of place. That concept expresses the understanding that colleges and universities have contributions to make to the health and vitality of communities where they are located. 
And at the same time, communities have talents and knowledge resources which can greatly enrich student learning and engagement. In 2012, we will be developing new ways for our campuses and communities to work together to strengthen our students' civic learning and at the same time, strengthen our democracy. Our question going forward for the future is, how can campuses join with communities to assess the civic health of their regions? And how can campuses and communities create initiatives to improve civic health and economic vitality while providing more powerful civic learning experiences for our students? Tackling the nation's complex challenges in an interconnected global environment requires that creative minds come together from schools, businesses, nonprofits, neighborhoods, and government, as well as higher education. This means valuing knowledge produced not only for specialized academic audiences, but also knowledge making which addresses pressing public problems. It also means moving beyond the expert knows best syndrome, developing instead deep collaborative partnerships that value different kinds of knowledge. Imagining America, artists and scholars in public life headquartered at Syracuse University promote scholarship through humanities, arts, and design across the country. Our question, how can colleges and universities create the incentives and structures of support necessary to expand public scholarship into a pervasive ethos and practice, not simply scattered activities? Um. So we have five breakout sessions, uh, so just a couple logistical instructions. Good afternoon. Everybody is going to be... One of the most important purposes of educating you, our nation. Um, so in, you guys all have the breakout room number that you are... It's on the back of your name tag. It says the breakout group that you're with. Groups one and five are going to be staying here in Southport Auditorium. Group one is deepen civic identity, values, and vision. Group five is provide evidence, civic learning, and college success. So you guys, uh, one and five, will be staying here. Group two, expand public scholarship and research, is going to be heading to room 228. So you guys are going to be heading out that way, taking a right, and either taking the elevator or taking the stairs up to the second floor. Group three is in room 226, and that's build and strengthen community and campus connections. Uh, same as 228, head out that room, that side over there and go to your right, up the stairs or up the elevator. And group four is 428, advanced civic learning and engagement in democracy across school and college. That is, you're probably going to want to take the elevator out that way to the right, grab one of the two elevators that way, and head up to the fourth floor. So group four and 428. It's all up here. Um, and then everybody, just make sure you guys are back here by 5 o'clock because that's when the end of the session is going to begin. Thank you. It's that the president had not valued it and hadn't helped organize the students and hadn't helped steer them to the paths of really constructive organizations within the Chicago area where they could volunteer and actually thrive and have a, have a part of their education that rounded them out as a whole person. And we spent a lot of time during those years talking about how best to optimize these extraordinary academic institutions to broaden the shaping of the students. Um, I served on the board of a local community development organization also when I was living in High Park, and the university uh, placed one of its senior officers on that board. And the mission of that not-for-profit was to work with the communities surrounding the university to improve the quality of life for the residents. The university, for those of you who aren't familiar with Chicago, uh, is in a great neighborhood not far from downtown, right on the lake, but it's surrounded by, on three sides, by very poor, predominantly African-American communities, the fourth side by this beautiful lake. And for so long, the university didn't have a great relationship with the surrounding community. And through the leadership of then President Sun and Shine, supported by President Randall and then President Zimmer, it really worked to break down the barriers of its relationship with the surrounding neighborhoods, not just because it was in the self-interest of the university, but because it was a part of its mission. And I think that it sent a message to the students about their responsibility for the surrounding community and that if they really were going to be a member not just of the institutional community, 
but of the broader community that they had to engage. And so that experience really, I think, shaped my life. I know it shaped the First Lady, and it certainly shaped the President, since we used to talk to him a great deal about this when he was a professor at the University of Chicago. And the whole thought was, let's get everyone engaged, and let's really focus on the students from the perspective of their civic responsibility in, in addition to their academic excellence. And so we welcome you here, and we hope that this provides us, as Roberto said, a launching off point, a catalyst, the beginning of what we hope will be an ongoing engagement. We're hoping that we'll be able to share best practices across such an extraordinary uh, group of, of experts in the field. And we really want, for all those who are listening out there or watching um, on the internet, to heighten the dialogue and have everyone appreciate this really unique opportunity we have with a president who values education as much as President Obama does, and who also values the importance of engagement and sharing um, across the country. So I'm delighted to be here to welcome you uh, to the White House, and I hope that you have a terrific afternoon. We're so excited about this, and we look forward to an ongoing conversation with you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Jarrett. We know she's very busy. Uh, it says a lot in terms of this administration's commitment to educating students for citizenship to have Valerie Jarrett join us today. Uh, as it was mentioned, we have an ambitious agenda today, so we're going to move right into our next speakers. Under Secretary Martha Cantor is a lifelong educator and administration's lead champion for President Obama's 2020 goal to have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world by 2020. Under Secretary Cantor, we'll discuss what led her to commission the report being released today by the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement over a year ago. And we'll then hear from Carol Schneider as well. Uh, now to Dr. Cantor, my boss. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and delighted that all of us could come together really for one purpose. So you heard Eduardo talk about uh, the President's 2020 goal, which is to have the best educated, most competitive workforce in the world. And when I heard him talk about that shortly after he was elected in 2009, I thought to myself, who will these people be? What kinds of people will they be to lead this country forward? So while the goal may be to have more graduates, I think stepping back from that a little bit and thinking about who those graduates will be, will be the people who will lead the next generation. So for us, the goal is to prepare each new generation to be hopefully more civically minded, more engaged, and more ready to lead so that we can do a lot better than, in my view, we've done in the last 50 to, to 100 years. So, you know, when I think about over this past year what's happened, um, the universal human hunger for equal justice and progress and for shared tolerance and dignity was unleashed with far-reaching consequences in an unexpected part of the world. As the Arab Spring crossed borders and seasons passed, we looked across and looked at the great price of freedom. Uh, and so like many of you, our eyes were on the Middle East. We were looking at what was happening across not only America because of that, but across the world. And we witnessed, I think, all of us, the great price of freedom and the far greater promise that gives men and women the courage to pay that price. So when I think now to where we are today, um, I truly believe that the struggle to shape and secure more representative forms of government in nations around the globe will be a hallmark of, of the 21st century. So I, like many of you in this audience, worry about the democracy and then worry about who are the students that we're graduating that will become the people who will lead our democracy forward and run the corporations and run the small businesses and be the teachers in the school, and be the firefighter next door. So I think it's in that context that when President Obama gave his speech uh, at Cairo University in 2009, 
He said, we have a responsibility to join together on behalf of the world that we seek, a world where governments serve their citizens and the rights of all God's children are respected, but we have the power to make the world we seek only if we have the courage to make a new beginning. And I think those words really uh, resonated with me, and I'm sure it's an audience of friends here that felt similarly. So today, you know, for our country, this is no less consequential for me than the Arab Spring has been most recently. Um, it's time to renew our sense of who we are, what we stand for, what we would like to see happen in our colleges and universities, in our K-12 schools. I'm thrilled that the Civic Mission of Schools is here, as well as all the higher education leaders. I see Nancy Cantor out in the audience from Syracuse and others who have done so much. I think every person in this room has done so much over the last 20 and 30 years, and I think it's time for us to all galvanize together to see where we go next. So that's what we hope to do this afternoon. Um, as no time uh, to, as today has education mattered more, um, a generation ago we led the world in college attainment. Today we're 16th in the world. Um, so when President Obama says he'd like us to be the best we can be, and I know there's a flag that goes up sometimes saying, does being the best mean that other people will not be the best? And to that I say no. It means that we need many more bests in this country, and the reason we we can do this is to have many more high-performing, high-functioning democracies that will be led by the children in our K-12 schools and the adults that are in college today. So by promoting the reforms that I think our administra administration has, has, has stood for, at least I've, I've been here two and a half years, I'm not sure about Roberto and the others, other colleagues from the Department of Education, uh, but when we think about excellence and equity in education and the, the nomenclature about winning the future, for me, it's, it's winning our civic life. It's winning our democracy. It's taking our democracy back to its roots and moving it forward so we can really have a modern democracy that we all are proud of. And the president has made very clear that education is a civic and moral imperative as well as an economic imperative. So that also has been a driver for me and for Dr. Oshoa and others of us in the Department of Education. I think you'll hear Arne Duncan talk about this when he comes and speaks with you at the end of the afternoon. Uh, I'm very concerned, if, as you'll read in the Crucible Moment Report, uh, the 2010 National Assessment of Education Progress, NAEP, among the 4th and 8th and 12th grade students tested, no age group has reached even 30% performance in proficiency in civics. I mean, that's, for our nation, we have to change this, and higher education can play an enormous role in doing that, especially with the talk and work around the college and career standards. As we raise standards, let's raise the content of what civic learning really can be for students in the K-12 system, as well as the undergraduate and graduate students. Um, NAEP found a persistent and significant civic, civic achievement gap among, among racial and ethnic groups and documented declines in our overall civic knowledge of high school seniors between 2006 and 2010. So it's for good reason that our current lack of civic education and participation has been called by some scholars a civic recession. And that's why we have to have a renewed focus on civic learning in our coursework and across the curriculum and across all sectors of education, public and private, for-profit, non-profit organizations. Um, as noted in the recent studies, including the Guardian of Democracy report that you have in your packet, which we're making available to you today, um, I don't, I think, need to preach to the choir about the benefits of civic knowledge and skills and dispositions, why this works. What we need is more scholarship, and I think you'll hear from some of our scholars like Harry Boyd and others who are here this afternoon, Carol Schneider. Uh, Martha. And, uh, and Carol Schneider of the Association for American Colleges and Universities will highlight the report's findings. Our National Endowment for the Humanities Chairman Jim Leach will moderate a panel on higher education's call for engagement in democracy. Jim, thank you. And Kettering Foundation President David Matthews will moderate a discussion with students and educators titled Changing Lives, Changing Communities. Harry Boyt, Director of the Center for De Democracy and Citizenship at Augsburg College, 
will describe the new American Commonwealth Project and introduce a short video that provides the framework for our breakout sessions. And then we'll break into small group discussions. So some of you are joining us on whitehouse.gov. I know many of you have organized your own local discussions. When we return for the remainder of the program, we'll hear report outs from these White House discussions. Those of you online can send highlights of your conversations to civiclearning at ed.gov. And then we'll hear some announcements from these new civic learning commitments before remarks from three key administration officials. We'll hear from our own outstanding Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. We'll hear from Robert Velasco, the CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service. And then my own colleague, Jonathan Greenblatt, Director of the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. We'll be guided all along throughout the course of our program today by Dr. Eduardo Ochoa, who's Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education, and he'll serve as our MC throughout our time here. And finally, I'd like to just issue a brief reminder for you to silence your electronic devices throughout our conversation today. So now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Valerie Jarrett, Senior Advisor to President Obama and Assistant to the President for Intergovernmental Affairs. Ms. Jarrett has been a beacon of civic leadership both in government and in business. It's an honor for me to welcome her. Please uh, join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Roberto. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. I want to start by uh, singling out for thanks both Jim Leach and David Matthews, who did so much in terms of their leadership pulling together this forum today, and of course, Martha Cantor, who uh, Ro Roberto mentioned from the Department of Education, who's also been instrumental, and Arnie Duncan, our secretary, is looking so forward to, to joining you a little later in the day. Uh, President Obama has made education his top priority. Hopefully that's no secret to you. And as we think about the education system and preparing our young people for job opportunities after they finish school, it's also important to think about the fact that we're preparing them for life. And I come at this and I'll just tell you my personal story. I served uh, as vice chair of the board of the University of Chicago for a number of years and chair of the medical center. And it's uh, one of the organizations that I worked in with the first lady. And her first position at the University of Chicago uh, was working in the president's office, organizing the students to do volunteer work. And it wasn't that the students didn't do volunteer work before. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the White House. My name is Roberto Rodriguez. I am uh, the Special Assistant to President Obama for Education here at the Domestic Policy Council. And it's my honor to welcome you here today uh, and to thank you for joining us today for Democracy's Future, Education Reclaims Our Civic Mission. I want to welcome each of you here in person as well as those of you who are joining us online tuning in on whitehouse.gov. Uh, it's an exciting day today that we have prepared and I want to do all I can to make sure that we fit it all in. So I'm going to be brief here in welcoming you. I'd like to speak briefly about why we're hosting today's conference. I want to provide a high-level overview of today's agenda. And I'd like to do just some brief housekeeping before introducing our first speaker for opening remarks. So I'd like to discuss a few points that are relevant to today's event. First, we're gathered to begin a national conversation, a national dialogue about the purpose of education in our country uh, and to explore the role of schools, colleges, universities, and their partners in preparing our young people to be informed, engaged participants in civic and democratic life and in each of their respective communities. This afternoon's convening is framed on three important reports that I'd like to mention. Uh, and these are important contributions to civic education that will be discussed throughout today's proceedings. The first is Guardian of Democracy, the Civic Mission of Schools. This is produced by the Coalition for the Civic Mission of Schools and released in October of last year. The second is A Crucible Moment, College Learning and Democracy's Future. This report is being released today. It was commissioned by our administration and produced by the National Task Force on Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement. 
And third, civic learning and engagement in democracy, a roadmap and call to action. This is produced by the Department of Education and also being released today. So I also want to uh, highlight that we will be announcing some key commitments by the Obama administration and other education stakeholders gathered today. That's another reason why we've all come together. And then finally, and most importantly, we are here to issue a call to action to accept a shared responsibility for the future of our students and to galvanize all of our partners here today, education, business, philanthropy, community-based organizations, and others to, in this important effort to make sure that our young people are prepared for full citizenship so that they're ready to tackle the grand challenges that face our country and really lead us forward in the years to come. So I know I speak for everyone here today that I say that Today must not be a culminating event. It's really a catalytic one. This is the first of a national conversation that needs to happen to really promote civic learning and civic engagement in society. To give us just a quick sketch of our agenda, our undersecretary, and I'm going to ask each of uh, my colleagues here to um, raise their hands so that the audience can recognize them as I mention them. Uh, our Undersecretary of Education, Martha Cantor, will tell us why the Department of Education commissioned the Crucible Moment Report. Uh, 